limber up. <laughs> I did earlier limbering up exercises, but you weren't invited to that, Steve. <laughs> you don't do any of these things. I don't need to hydrate. I don't need to clear my throat. I don't need to prepare. I don't need to get up to pee or to poop. I don't need to do any of the things that everybody on YouTube does. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I'm Jewish. I have to do that for everything I do. <laughs> Good morning, Glory. Say there, stop that yawning. A brand new day is dawning. Pull up the shade and let the sun come through. Good morning, glory. Spend about an hour underneath the shower and keep on singing like the birdies do. Books of the week back on the air on CPL radio. I'm at home. No, I'm not fired. Steve. Um, <laughs> and the man I'm wagging a finger at, which I will do numerous times throughout this episode, I'm sure, is book critic Steve Donahue in Boston, Massachusetts. And good morning. Hello, everybody. I should reassure all of our listeners that I am well able to fire Jeff at home. <laughs> you not have to be in the office. What? Granted, we can have lines of people cheering as he perp walks out. <laughs> well, you know, as grim as that sounds, I had a clean bill of health yesterday, so <laughs> at least there's that. <laughs> what do we do on this uh, very serious show? Well, what we do is we talk about books, traditionally new arrivals. Uh, we like to look at a nonfiction sampling move on over to the fiction section and then um for my sins i get to throw books at, <laughs> at steve's head for the wild card segment uh so that's exciting and uh beyond that we're just happy to be here and steve i bet you have a non-fiction title for us to start us off this week the the non-fiction title that we're starting with this time we're using nonfiction here very loosely. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Sunny Boy by the actor Al Pacino. Your brow doesn't usually furrow this much this early in the show. <laughs> no. No, it doesn't. Uh, this book is Sunny Boy by Al Pacino. The <laughs> who has had an active career for 50 years. And yet the title of his book is from a role he played 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, what a legacy. <laughs> where to begin? <laughs> where to begin with this book? Uh, I've, I've all, seen Al in interviews uh, in the last 10 years. He'll show up on Letterman, he'll show up on Colbert, whatever. And his interviews are always really interesting because none of them make any sense. Does this book, is this book like that? <laughs> okay. All right. We should take the 30,000 foot view to start with. We should all agree on the Linnaean classifications to start with before we get into the weeds. So let's go to 30,000 feet and make the self-evident observation, I think it was Newton's fourth law, that actors are really stupid. <laughs> they are really stupid. It's not just that they have absolutely no grasp on who they are. <laughs> they don't just start a new role. They take on a new persona. Right. Oh, I'm feeling like a cowboy today. Okay, honey, but we're at the breakfast table. Oh, no, I'm feeling like a dictator today. <laughs> They're really, really stupid. And once they have a hit, any hit of any kind, any dimension whatsoever, once they have a hit, they're also God. Everything around them in their personal reality field jumps at their merest look. This is true for people you have not heard of. <laughs> this is true for people that, whose names you don't know. Right, There's a right. Broadway actor whose first name is Hamish. You don't know him. You might recognize him as a bit player in a background of a movie. Even he, it's true for him. Most people outside the entertainment industry have never heard the name Peter Berg. And if right. they have, they recognize him as a bit player in a hospital drama 50 right. years ago. He has a reality distortion field around him that has been there for 45 years. Al Pacino has a reality distortion field. <laughs> even, even Clam Gal. <laughs> She thinks she's Clam Gal right now. <laughs> Maybe Clam Gal kept her feet on the ground. That's <laughs> possible. But Al Pacino has not. 
And I mean in every little detail. I mean, I know that it's a lot to ask of my producer, but imagine for a minute that your entire reality was dictated by an egomaniacal prima donna. <laughs> this is like science fiction to me, but go ahead. <laughs> people all around these people will use Sonny Boy. We'll use Al Pacino here as an example. It's what the people all around them have to deal with. So, so that the person's aunt or their oldest friend will come up to them and say, God, you remember who was raining buckets when you got married the first time out of your 18 times? And the star will say, no, it was bright and sunny. And not only are you expected to say, oh, you're right, it was bright and sunny with cold sweat on your face because you might have to work for a living. But also they expect that the Los Angeles Weather Bureau will change the record. <laughs> if someone like that has been telling well-worn old chestnut stories for 50 years what connection are those stories going to have to reality <laughs> what, what, how are they going to be anything but fiction it's like when you're at summer camp and you do that whisper game where you say you know uh the the you know the fire truck is red, and by the time it comes around, when you whisper it, everybody it says like, uh, you know, the corset has sequins. I mean, it just it like <laughs> only, only in this scenario, the last person, the one who's saying the corset has sequins, is saying yeah. it's the message has always been like that, and if you don't agree, you'll never work at this summer camp again. Uh, right, right, sure. So, I'm not saying that we are in the weird quantum wave collapse that was melania trump's book yes <laughs> we're not far off nothing in this book actually happened pacino didn't write it he's an idiot all <laughs> are morons remember the instagram you saw an instagram feed where a suburban couple finds a, a, a deer fawn that's been abandoned it's in their backyard sure. it's just laying there perfectly innocent and they think, well, we can feed you with an eyedropper and we can get you on your feet and a little healthier and maybe your mother will reclaim you. That little deer has the intellectual equivalent of any movie star that you have ever watched. That's what they are. They are essentially brainless, single-celled organisms devoted <laughs> to their own ego trips. So... So, so what does this what does this blobfish have to say about anything? He has to say I was on this set and so and so told me this story. And, oh wow! And then I was uh, I was up for this part and I didn't take it. And can you believe I didn't take it when it went on like that? And none of it's true. None of it's true. <laughs> the only way that you'll ever find anyone in Hollywood who'll say no, Pacino, no, that story, that's not true. The only way you'll ever find anyone who'll say that is to find someone who cannot be hurt by him which is a handful of people, usually every bit as delusional as he is. Robert sure. De Niro, you call him on a lie. But Robert De Niro's personal distortion field is even bigger than his. So <laughs> right, right, right. so let me ask you this. What, what, what is the impetus for writing this book outside of, is this his, uh, I don't know, something to put on the outside of his crypt? Because he's not young. And so not what young. does he gain? What does he gain with this outside of a legacy? Is, that what, is this a legacy thing? Gross. Mind, he, didn't write <laughs> he didn't write it. You have to keep that in mind. But it, it, the, the thing with these creatures, with these egomaniacal doe <laughs> fawn, uh, is are you in the circuit? Are you relevant? Are you are you on, you know, Seth Meyers? Oh. And um, Pacino's not in anything right now. Not really, He's no. Not in any kind of project right now. And yeah. this is a way, if you're an egomaniac who constantly needs to have your existence reaffirmed, you need that. You need to be talked about. And, of course, he would like it. I'm sure that every cokehead Hollywood star would like it if they wrote a memoir that people were saying, you know, this isn't like most celebrity memoirs. This is <laughs> this is actually kind of good, right? <laughs> uh, uh, Born a Crime, for instance. Oh, right. Yeah, Trevor Noah. Uh, or Elton John's memoir, which, right. where he, he liberally acknowledges that he had a ghostwriter for the whole thing. But still, it is honest. It is, it is genuine. Mm. And I'm yeah. sure that every Hollywood star wants that said about their book. The only encouraging thing I find about the fact that Al Pacino's people put a book together and put his name on it uh, is that it shows it shows a reverence for the kind of immortality that only the written word can give you. I mean, this is Al Pacino, right? He's had a lot of successful movies. You of course, would think, yeah. He would think that that would make him immortal. 
but they still feel compelled to write a book. <laughs> it's a win for us book people that non-bookish people think this. I mean, what what possible reason could even enter the mind of Melania Trump to put her name on a book if that <laughs> wasn't the reason? What? But, you know, by writing a book, Pacino's in the same camp as Metin's Adventure magazines. I mean, he's in the... Why would he want to share? <laughs> the enjoyment of, of Men's Adventure always brings me back to the heartbreak of these books because yeah. Al Pacino is untouchable. It's true that he that he... He lives in this weird, distorted world where, <laughs> oh, that was a real belly flop you did in the pool. Oh, uh, honey, we don't have a pool. Yes, we do. Oh, you're right, we do. Uh, he lives in that world every day, and it's if, and if you haven't touched that world, you don't know how sick it is. But, but when someone comes out with a book like this, I always think, well, okay, imagine if Al Pacino had a brain. He's invulnerable. Imagine the book he could write. Sure. And this is not that. This is yeah. well-thumbed notes that don't tell the, the dirt on anyone, including serious federal crimes dirt that he knows, <laughs> that he's seen. Right, right, right. None of it is, none of it is there. It's like, yeah. it's, it's the weirdest thing. You want this thing to be your legacy, but there's nothing in it that's true. Yeah, yeah. It, it's more of a pamphlet that could be titled, Why Should I Like Al Pacino? <laughs> I mean, I it sounds firmly, like... I firmly believe that if this thing has sales, or critical attention, and God help the people at the LA Times. God protect their souls for what they do. A, a book review is a sacred space. You don't yeah. you don't curry favor with a star in a book review. Uh, but th I firmly believe that any kind of positive attention that this book is getting, and I'm assuming it has a waiting list at the library. It does. That's why I uh, threw it out there this week. <laughs> Absolutely. I firmly believe that all of that just comes from people saying, oh, I've liked him in movies. Sure. That's all. They don't want to know what stories this imbecile has to tell. They don't want right, to hear it. Right. That. And the worst like, part Yeah, the, the worst part of it is is that they say, "Oh, I like him in movies. I'd like to learn more about him." But it sounds to me like this is a <laughs> you do not learn any more about him. No, you'll learn all sorts of things, but they aren't true. Hey, that was a belly flop you did in the pool. Oh, honey, we don't have a pool. That's what you'll learn. So So our nonfiction segment is not a recommend. You know, well, that's true. Um, what I <laughs> what I would like, uh, can we could you recommend then if someone's into a good actor's memoir, would you have an alternate uh, that maybe they could find in our library system? Wait, all right, I can. I don't know if they can find it in the library system. It did really well, so maybe I can recommend something else. It's my go to. Well, oh, born a crime, but but you know that, that's no Trevor's not. A Hollywood actor, so right, uh, but I can make the recommendation. But I want to stress first that my opening contentions are true. Not only is the author a complete idiot, a complete idiot, little kitten sucking on an eyedropper, idiot, wouldn't know the first thing about how to walk down a street <laughs> if you let them loose in the real world, no matter how many boutique farms they buy in Montana, they're absolute <laughs> idiots. And number two. Nothing in their books is true. <laughs> oh, they, they are living inside a personal reality distortion. So nothing in it is true. <laughs> if, as long as we agree to those two conditions, I can certainly recommend uh, Dear Me by Peter Ustinov. Oh. It's 170 years old, but it's, right. it's, it's really, really good. It's what this book could have been. I guess. <laughs> yes. And you know, maybe there's some truth to to the wary of Hollywood cokeheads about the lasting uh, virtues of a book, because who knows Peter Usnoff anymore? Right, right. Yeah. Or, or Dirk Bogad, or, or, you know, Dick Cavett, even. Who sure. knows these people anymore? Yeah, they William Holt. I mean, they 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 yeah, yeah. It's amazing. But, um, all right. Well, I, I guarantee you we have... Uh, as uh, crusty dusty as uh, Peter Ustinov could be considered, I guarantee you it's in our library system somewhere. Here so. he did really well. It yeah. will certainly be in some sort of library system. Excellent. All right. Uh, there we the go. The key here for you people who are on the waiting list, of course, first of all, I say get off the waiting list. There's, <laughs> this is not Soviet Russia. You should never be on a waiting list for a book. With a, with a library full of great books, you should never be on a waiting list for a book. What are you, a reader or a lemming? Uh, but also I want to point out that the book you want is... <laughs> I may, I may have to, I've never edited our shows, but I may have to edit that last bit out. You know they don't want you to. 
<laughs> you know this is good cop, bad cop. <laughs> they don't want you editing the bad cop. No, uh, of course not. In addition to that, I want to point out that the thing you want, the Al Pacino book you want, is to tell all of them that will be written by a reporter in 25 years. That's the one. <laughs> right, not right. this now. You don't want this right. now. You're never going to get invited to his mansion. This video, this, this book is not your ticket. Oh, I know, Al. <laughs> that you know, you know who really should be writing these tell-all Hollywood books? The Best Boy, the Key Grip. They're the ones who see <laughs> all right. of the and good they're stuff. They're the ones who sign NDAs at the beginning of every production, <laughs> and they're the ones who are often fired despite their NDAs. <laughs> mm, sounds <laughs> familiar. <laughs> oh my God, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes of even a minor yeah. Hollywood star movie is astonishing just yes. astonishing <laughs> the, the number the number of things that go on behind the scenes of what was that movie where de niro had a part about a a woman who falls from the sky as a star she's a living star who lands oh on her. yeah boy that was a yeah weird hairdo nobody remembers the movie nobody remembers <laughs> no. the movie. and there were enough there was enough drama behind the scenes of that movie to fill a court of the medicis <laughs> You'll never hear anything about it. Never. No. Everyone has been lawyered up six ways from Sunday, and they all need to work in this town. A word sounds... from him and you don't. A word <laughs> from him and you never work again. That that old saw is true. So what kind of weird bacchanal of Soviet <laughs> history erasure do you have to do to get to Al Pacino's sunny boy? A mountain of it is what you have to do. So why waste your time reading that? Why Why do it? Why waste your time reading that when he didn't read it and none of it's true? Why? I've never heard Hollywood described closer to organized crime than I just heard. <laughs> I mean, straight up. Like, but you know what's exciting, Steve, is I have. I've got the headshot. I've got the still <laughs> for a man who's advertising himself as the next Al Pacino. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited to see his work. We always get our hopes up for some Hollywood actor that we think will tell it straight. We always get our hopes up for that. We think, what about a Hollywood actor who had a thriving big screen career and then went into TV, which is separate, right. and made mountains of money so that he is invulnerable to the Hollywood backbiting, to the Medici backstabbing. <laughs> what if someone like that wrote a book? Surely that book would be completely real and completely honest. Well, there is an ex there are many examples of people like that, but a big example is Carol O'Connor, Archie Bunker. Oh, sure, yeah. He wrote a number of books. They're full of lies. <laughs> 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 so so <laughs> if he can't do it, well, first of all, you cast your eye back on the Hollywood stars who very conspicuously did not write books. They're the ones who had brains and knew if I write a book, I'll have to lie. So I'm not going to do it. Sure. When we look at Hollywood stars today and we think of the ones that maybe have brains, uh, Adam Driver, for instance. Sure. Scarlett Johansson. We, we see them and we think, okay, well, then surely if they write a book, it'll be the way things really are. But they either they will write a book that is just like Sonny Boy. Yeah. Uh, or they will write nothing at all. <laughs> it seems like writing nothing at all might be the most ethical thing they could do. <laughs> you know? Well, actually, actually, no. It's, <laughs> it's the least ethical thing they could do because if they told all, they would have talked about Harvey Weinstein a long time ago. Well, true. I guess he both of them. He'd be rotting in jail instead of a free man. Right, right. If, if, and and of course, that's just Harvey Weinstein. We we won't we won't name names about anybody else, mm -hmm. any X Men director. <laughs> we won't talk about any other obvious monsters. <laughs> yeah, obvious yes. monsters. <laughs> We're just roaming around Hollywood because no one will write that book. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, the book is Sunny Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel so sorry for you in your wrap up to each segment because you you've got to you've got to broom the pile <laughs> off the floor and then say, you go back to producer mode and say the book is available now <laughs> no no i've got a way out because i've decided to underwrite these uh, these sections and the review of sunny boy was underwritten by wiener wrap it turns plain hot dogs into four different meals <laughs> at your if local grocery we're being honest he could tell you a lot about wiener wraps <laughs> you won't get a word of them in sunny boy Oh, Sunny Boy. Oh, I like that movie. That was when I was in grade school. What was that? Oh, I like him. <laughs> oh, my. Well, enjoy your time on the, on the waiting list. <laughs>
<laughs> maybe while you're on the waiting list, you can do something good for a neighbor. I don't know, <laughs> like mow their lawn. I, I, you've got time. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the. Uh, <laughs> To Just the my favorite year sweat is all over his forehead. <laughs> I'm telling you, though, this is why they watch. Because a perfectly nice producer reached out to somebody he liked on BookTube, and the nightmare has not stopped. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Look at that. Steady as a rock, Steve. Look, come on. I'm doing really good. <laughs> Um, we like to talk about fiction books as well, and I'm sure you brought a victim, a, a book today. Steve. I have. I bought a thriller, Tony mm. Wirt's book, Pike Island, mm. which is pretty good. I don't know. Thank if God. Good. Oh, thank God. <laughs> There's still a rant coming. This is a story of a man named Harry Leonard, who is idyllically married. He is uh, he's an up and comer in local politics. People are eyeing him as a state rep or even a representative of the House of Congress and maybe even president. Hmm. He's got the look. He's got the bearing. He's got everything that he needs. He's got the charisma. He's got the family. He's got the well-vetted past that seems spick and span uh, until a postcard arrives at his idyllic home addressed to Andy Leonard, which is a name he hasn't used since high school. His wife knows that. And the, the, the postcard is, to put it mildly, uh, threatening. He was on what yeah. he did with a bunch of other teenagers on Pike Island when he was a teenager. Hmm. Uh, what a, was that? What happened on that island? It's a quality setup. I like that. It's a quality setup. And what follows is his wife and him and a few other political figures deciding what to do about this. Mm. And you alternate between that and Pike Island. And mm. Wirt does a good job of that. He keeps you reading by shifting the time frames, by shifting the points of view. Uh, so as a thriller, it's certainly going to be filmed. Mm. And as a thriller, it will not disappoint. Uh, so you might be wondering where my rant could possibly come from. <laughs> my rant comes from the fact that this book exists in our reality. This book oh. is not being published on Earth 2. It exists in our reality. Yeah. So I'm, I want to ask you, in our reality, readers who live in this reality are reading this book, what could Tony Wirt, Andy Wirt, or, only, or Andy Leonard, what could he have done on Pike Island? That would derail his presidential ambitions. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> There's literally nothing he could have done on Pike Island. <laughs> this would have been an incredibly effective thriller in the 1960s. Sure. <laughs> or even the 1980s. But in 2024, any reader of this book is going to remember someone we think was named George Santos. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't named George Santos, who was married but wasn't straight, who who campaigned against drag shows and was in drag shows, who had four different names that we know of and no one yet knows which one he was born with or whether he was born at all. Was he born at <laughs> in Alpha Centauri? We don't know. His entire being, exactly. His entire being was the clam lady. His entire being is fictional and he is alive. He's free despite having committed massive fraud on the American people. And he has a podcast, like us, <laughs> bigger audience than we do. And he is, he is, that flesh and blood person, George Santos, is completely fictional. There's no one actually there at all. There's a, man, there's a man named J.D. Vance, who also may not, may or may not exist. <laughs> who, who is a candidate for vice chancellor in a fascist regime. <laughs> A million things have come out of his closet. No. They're not finished coming out. No. <laughs> you just have to take one look at his... I don't know if, if there's such a thing as Gaydar in Wisconsin, but you just have to take one look at the guy to know at least one skeleton that has not come out of his closet, right. Right. so to speak. There's one skeleton that has not come out of the closet. I don't know how they do Gaydar in Wisconsin where everyone goes bundled up, but I guarantee you right. there's somebody out there from some campus that has a story to tell that I would, I would guess is about six and a half inches long. We, we do we do it this way, Steve. This is how we do it. <laughs> this is a, this is a Vance has extensive experience with nose warmers, I would say. And um, 
there's also one other thing that every 2024 reader of Pike Island is going to be thinking, uh, which is that maybe there's a candidate for president who's an ardent fan of Adolf fucking Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> if that coming out of your past from Pike Island, from Trump <laughs> Island, doesn't derail your presidential base, well, what can Pike Island do? What what can yeah. it do? This is a case. It's not, it's not Tony Wirt's fault. Right. This is a case where reality has outstripped fiction to such an extent. Yeah, yeah. If if somebody, if some enterprising publisher reprinted the Manchurian Candidate today, <laughs> right. audiences would laugh at it. Right, right. They would laugh exactly. at it. I, I suspect the candidate is about a candidate who maybe was compromised in his youth by yeah. a an agent, singular. Right. <laughs> and you're reading that in a world today where the formal the the front runner for the American presidential race has been convincingly fingered in a plot to sell Israel's nuclear profile to the Saudis for $2.2 billion. Everybody <laughs> knows that it happened. The money transfers are there. He won't deny it. The Saudis have acted on the information that they could only have got from the president of the United States. That is not, to put it mildly, one Russian agent compromising you when you were a kid. Right. <laughs> so, unless you're willing to go there, for your fiction, then what can Pike Island do? What, yeah. what can it do? What can Andy Leonard possibly have done on Pike Island? There, the answer is literally. I don't want to spoil the book, mm. but the answer is literally nothing. Oh, <laughs> for the 21st century reader, you're going to get to the big conclusion, and the, the conclusion is done well. Sure, the tension between those two points of view, between the shifting narrative, amps up as the book goes on. That's well done, but you're going to get to the big revelation, and I swear, anyone today in america especially is going to look at that revelation and say so what <laughs> i suspect tony tony probably had this book in his craw back in the 90s yeah, when the and, world you was, know. <laughs> yeah, he probably did and coincidentally i should point out that so what is also what the sitting president said when he was told that a bloodthirsty mob was about to kill his vice president <laughs> right when reality is doing that yeah what can fiction do right what can fiction possibly do? That's a very grim <laughs> summation. What can fiction do? <laughs> I mean, oi. <laughs> I think it accounts for the popularity of massive multi-volume epic fantasy novels. Yeah. yeah. Let's just get away from all that. How can you possibly tell a thriller like Pike Island today? Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, I guess the best you can do is like a Harlan Coben thing where it's like suburban thriller or something, because at least that reality right. could still, right. you know. Wife and a husband right now. Yeah. Right. Exactly. As long as the husband doesn't then have the wife killed and buried on his golf course, you're in clear. <laughs> you're absolutely in the clear. Right. Have her killed? Well, wasn't she sick? Yeah, she was so sick that she uh, that she smashed her head like a broken egg by falling down two flights of stairs. Two steps <laughs> in her suburban home. <laughs> which happens all the time yeah, yeah that happens all the time if you're found anywhere near stairs no matter how shallow the stairs are you must have taken a header from the stairs uh -huh. yeah oh, and the new york herald interview where the victim said just don't let him bury me on one of his goddamn golf courses." <laughs> that of course was not remembered by anyone yeah no one remembered that in order to literally pour dirt on someone's memory no one remembered that. No, of course not. It's just a coincidence. Unbelievable. <laughs> hole in one. <laughs> the hole in one. From, from an old, an old sick ex-wife who was in talks to write a memoir. Mm. Oh, I did not know. <laughs> this just no. in on Books of the Week. <laughs> no. And it wouldn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, so it wouldn't if, matter. If a rumor circulates that your candidate, we won't specify which candidate, really, it could be any candidate, was... It, it, the uh, story is about to drop about him groping an underage girl on someone's island. If a story like that were to leak into the media, well, in 2024, the social media responses that you would have seen on Twitter would have been, yeah, oh, that's cool. Right, oh, she right. had come. Hundreds of those responses. It's not just that the base will overlook it, it's that they're eager for it. Yeah, so, yeah. What can Mike right. Harlan do? Absolutely. I mean, what did what did Harry Leonard do? Did he extort <laughs> the world with nuclear weapons? Is that, is that what he did? 
<laughs> he has one million dollars. <laughs> Is that all? I've got that in my pocket right now. <laughs> Where's Robert Wagner when you need him? <laughs> uh, sir? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, so, but it's well written. You say it's well and written, it's, but you're going to be disappointed. Well, as well done as it is, yeah. you're going to be disappointed. Tony Wirt really should have gone for the suburban thriller. Yeah, yeah. Because Has Mr. Wirt... There is nothing from anyone's past. George Santos would get reelected. If he ran for <laughs> office, he would get reelected. <laughs> right. Which is really the end. Has Mr. Wirt been around for a while? I don't know. I'm not familiar yeah. with other work. Okay, so he's been yeah. he's been at this game for a while. He had a hit okay. with his last book. And his last book wasn't... Uh-huh. It, didn't, it didn't deal with... This book entirely revolves around the big career-ending reveal at the end. It entirely <laughs> revolves around that. And it can't. Yeah. It can't revolve around that. <laughs> Is there anyone listening to me now that thinks that Donald Trump's ratings with his base would not go up if the story that's being rumored and that drops on in you know Rolling Stone or Politico tomorrow is that he murdered someone. Right, right. Does anyone <laughs> think his ratings would not go up? Of course they would. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. He... So, uh, can the you imagine someone saying, Mr. Trump, you have a Pike Island in your past? And he says, actually, I've got nine Pike Islands in my past. Yeah, and I'd like to spell them to you as long as you do. Right. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, this book also <laughs> is available at your Cedarburg Public Library. And um, it's brought to you to this week by Batgirl. You can see Batgirl in person. <laughs> there I am, first in line. <laughs> It's a good time for all. Uh, what the- <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> Nothing but the best. That was a lot of hoagies ago, wasn't it? <laughs> it was indeed. <laughs> you know, I'm well fed. <laughs> so um, we're going to move on to the wild card, as if the show has been so not wild thus far. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope for some positivity in the wild. We can do this. I think we, we can do, do this. I would either be because you picked a lot of winners or you got a different coast. <laughs> <laughs> Your star is temperamental today. I'm going to write a book about it. <laughs> oh boy all right mr patino <laughs> let's see what we've got here i'm gonna dust off first off and i don't have my visual aids this week because i'm at home and i didn't want to slap a lot of books home i did anyway but not these so here we are let's start with a new nonfiction from this guy yes Yes, Yuval Noah Harari, Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise known by members of the intellectual dark web as Yuval. (laughs) Uh, I thought we were going to go positive. (laughs) I thought we were going to do that. He Uh, had high hopes. (laughs) This guy shot to fame and stardom for his book, Sapiens, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a history of humanity that has some interesting thinking in it. Mm Mm-hmm. And then he was suborned by Joe Rogan, by the intellectual uh, dark web, by the circle, something or other, uh, by the what what the commentators refer to as the the fart sniffing circle <laughs> of, of armchair intellectuals who don't really have anything to say other than how elaborate can I make my word games around the fact that I I do kind of think that Trump won in twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the admittance to the dark web is through Trump cult. I know nobody wants to admit that, especially the members of the dark, of the intellectual dark web, but the yeah. admittance to that world is through Trump cult. No other way. If you're not part of Trump cult, if you don't think Trump won, if you don't think he's not quite human, that he's more than human, mm-hmm. you won't get on this circuit. You won't get invited to this circuit. Yeah. And that happened Yeah, Yuval. Uh, you will adamantly deny it, but this latest book, what are the hallmarks of Trump cult? Just just tick them off. We don't even have to talk, for instance, about drooling loyalty to the leader. Mm-hmm. We can talk about the other elements of it. Sure. There's a revanchist Christianity. Uh, revanchist Christianity goes hand in hand with blatant science denial. Right. You have to deny science. You have to say that the the... the COVID vaccines killed millions of people. You have yeah, to yeah. be Brett Weinstein. You have to go on Tucker Carlson and say 17 million people died from, from the <laughs> COVID vaccines. And I guess right. they're just being shipped to an island somewhere so that we can't see them. You have to do that. And although they sneer at it, sooner or later, they're all going flat earth. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's in the Bible. Is that where Yuval's going? He would adamantly deny it. Oh. But Tucker Carlson was just just went mega viral a couple of months ago denying that evolution happened. <laughs> and what did he say in that interview? That God, not Shiva, not Brahma, his God, made people by magic. Well, if you're willing to do that on national television, then how far can you be from yeah. that? I mean, do we know that the Earth is a globe? <laughs> um, I'm not saying that any of that is in this book, in Nexus. Nexus is about how humans communicate. And once yeah. again, there are chapters that are good hmm. on the history and the nature of how humans communicate, especially mass scale. But it's there, lurking in the shadows of this book, more than the last one, but less than the next one. Yeah. Well, I uh, they have heft, so if you check them out, you're going to get more book for your book. <laughs> That's the best well, I can do. <laughs> if if our readers are if our listeners are wondering how do I know how do I know to avoid this? I don't want I don't want to read a book by someone who is even on that path. There is an easy way to know whether or not the person you're dealing with, the person you're thinking about reading, is in the intellectual dark web, has gone through the Trump cult to get there. There's a podcast called Trigonometry. Hmm. If a person has ever appeared on that podcast, they are there. That, oh, wow. Are, <laughs> just, just check. Don't watch their videos, for God's sake. But <laughs> just check their thumbnails. Huh. Has a person ever been on the set of Trigonometry? It's almost certainly true. There are only a couple of exceptions. And uh, the couple of exceptions are women <coughs> who uh, are less inclined to cult thinking than men. So, uh, so you know, it, it stands so, to reason. So trigonometry is like the pearly gates to... Well, there are um, others. No, the paradise is Joe Rogan. Where oh, you know, sure. Yeah, just, yeah. Just get high <laughs> as a kite denying that anything is real. Just right. deny anything is real. Hey, do you, do you, do you, do you read that found, they found a lizard on the surface of the sun? Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. So, the surface of the sun can't be all that hot. <laughs> People in the comments in real time saying, no, no, you know, that was a prank. It, it, was, it was labeled a prank. You, you, you glanced at the headline and you're stoned off your ass. That's why you're doing this. Right. Millions of biddable young men. <laughs> well i think this i don't know if i can do this to you but uh, i have to um this is a perfect segue so i do have to do this to you here's a guy who's uh kind of a god here in our lovely state of wisconsin less so now because he's a treasonous god but he has a book now called out of the darkness the mystery of aaron Rodgers by ian o'connor <laughs> Yes. He would love to. Uh, has Aaron ever been on the Rogan podcast? He seems like a prime I candidate. You, he has been. I guarantee it. Let's just say, I mean, <laughs> this is a contentious book, but Ian O'Connor is a fantastic writer. Hmm. So, no matter where you stand on the subject of Aaron Rodgers, in other words, whether you are right or wrong, <laughs> right. Uh, Ian O'Connor is worth reading. Even on this subject, he's worth reading. Sure. He's got a complicated, not Ian, uh, Aaron has, of course, a very complicated standing in our state. But there are still those who, the the Aaron era, that's fun to say, um, <laughs> has, um, that was the pinnacle of their lives. Not Aaron's life, but their lives. The Aaron era here for the Green Bay Packers. You, and his loss is something... May have gotten Trump elected. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, it's like, it's that tectonic a uh... elected in Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, what I want Ian O'Connor, I know that he watches this podcast as everyone does. I'm sure. What I want him to do, here's what I want you to do, Ian. Take that megawatt brain of yours and all that writing talent. What I want you to do is research and write the definitive history of Ruby Ridge. Mm. A fully contentious subject. Lots sure. of people on either side, plenty of ramifications for the present day, but no cult admission necessary. Do that. Go and research. Write the greatest book ever written on Ruby Ridge. Broaden it, if you want, to to you know Waco or yeah. the militia movements of the 1970s and 80s, sure. just in general. Write write the epic like that that will win the National Book Award. It'll win the Pulitzer. Go ahead and do that. Yeah. 
We'll see with his next book. We'll see so, what direction he goes in. So you're saying that the subject matter that uh, Ian has selected may be a bit slight for his talents. Is that what I'm hearing? Maybe it's slight, and it's also compromised. No. So find subject matter that is still contentious. He clearly likes doing that. He clearly likes writing yeah. about contentious stuff. Find subject matter that is contentious. Ruby yeah. Ridge is still contentious, and write about that. Or if you want to go, you want to go the A bomb of contentious. Write the first serious narrative history of 9/11 attacks. Yeah, that has not happened yet. That was taken over by Alex Jones right away at sure, ground zero, so sure, to speak. Sure. Right, right, no right. Absolutely. Do that and win a national book award for it. But that's well, our author published too soon because the biggest Aaron Rodgers story to come out was just last week when um, it discovered he was uh, he would pick his nose and eat it. <laughs> we have photographic evidence. <laughs> So I here on this show <laughs> have done that. Uh, let's let's end with a bang and hopefully a fun bang. I swear I can do this. We're gonna have something positive here. I Lord willing. <laughs> um, I bought two, what I would say is massive uh, reprints this week um, from Blackstone, which I did not know Blackstone was getting into that sort of business. But here they are with. Dangerous oh. Visions, and again, Dangerous Visions in oh, in preparation for the final volume that uh, Harlan Ellison, we thought, took to his grave. And here we are. So I have to know what Steve Donahue thinks of the Dangerous First. Visions universe. <laughs> First, he did take it to his grave. First, ah. he did take it to his grave. First, don't believe any of this crap. For Pete's sakes, W.C. Fields has been dead forever. P.T. Barnum has been dead forever. Stop being a sucker. Stop <laughs> believing what the publishing industry tells you. Harlan Nelson died about 100 years ago. He published every burp that he ever introduced. He did not see <laughs> on the, the last volume of Dangerous Visions. <laughs> Someone's in yell mode today, obviously. Uh, and we are all the better for it. <laughs> Dangerous Visions. The, the original anthology by Harlan Ellison is one of the most famous science fiction anthologies of all time. It's, sure. it's been lauded. It has a history of its own. It did really well. He uh, did what Harlan always did, which was lie and say that it had always been the first volume and what he projected to be a multi-volume series. That's totally untrue. Uh, but he came out with another one and then another one. You will get greats in Dangerous Visions. There are great figures in Dangerous Visions, but it sure. is a bad anthology. It's not just that it's not a great anthology. It's a bad one because it's chummy. It's <sighs> it's, it's a men's club. Yeah. It, Harlan Nelson didn't just pick, like, like Asimov or the great Terry Carr or Gardner Dozwell much later, he didn't just pick stories that he thought, oh, you know, the more I think about that, the more I think that was important or really yeah. good. He went to buddies of his. Mm-hmm the buddies that he shared convention stories with about how many fans did you bag? Right. right. And up until the, the ERA, up until the women's rights movement, those stories also included an addendum about how many of them were willing. And it was all done a joke. It was all, people just laughed at it. There's nothing yeah. funny about that, but that was the culture of science fiction at the time. And very much so it's carved out of that culture. It's just, I, I went to, I thought, well, he puts a mean golf game. Uh, uh, has a, a fine nose for brandy. So here's his story that you should read. Like those things are connected in any way. <laughs> yeah, there are some good things in in Dangerous Visions, and of course, I wholeheartedly applaud Blackstone for reprinting anything. Yeah, our reprint culture should be really strong. There's not just because most of what's printed today is junk, but also because there's a lot of great stuff that's gone out of print. Yeah. And not everybody has access to used bookstores. Sure. These beautiful editions. I mean, they're a little um, slight. The paper that's printed on is oh, really? a, a bit onion skin-ish. How but... are they for their makeup? I mean, are they well-made, well-bound? Yeah. The binding, I, I would trust. Um, but um, the it is interesting that this third volume, I think Michael Straczynski is the one who's spearheading this final volume, I, his handprints all over, and I believe he was in that boys club of Ellison that you're talking about. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting that uh, it's it's not out yet, but soon. I agree with you on. I've never done again Dangerous Visions, but I've slogged through Dangerous Visions, and like you said, there's a few uh, keepers, a couple winners in there, but boy, there's some very 
unreadable the atmosphere of the thing which is yeah. which is conveyed in the introductions the yes. self congratulatory introductions <laughs> to every story the atmosphere of the thing is so collusive yeah. like you get halfway through if you're a man you get halfway through and you think oh, wait a minute do i have to agree with all of this <laughs> <laughs> yes read the stories i mean you're not coming out and saying it but yeah ugh. yeah interesting yeah it uh, if if dangerous visions is being reprinted that's great and yeah. i i kind of wonder what kind of readership it'll have at the library really, i'm good to you... fan already has a copy yeah, well, that's actually the problem is I think that's what Blackstone was responding to. In our system, we have like one copy and it's the one that looks like, you know, LSD uh, trip uh, cover. So it's been a long time. It really kind of has never been properly in. I mean, there have been other reissues, but they're very, yeah. you know, it's this seems like a much more concerted effort to say, if you're interested in the history of, of the genre, this is what benchmark even if it's a questionable benchmark. It is so. a benchmark anthology. What I want yeah, you yeah. to do, not you, because you're beyond hope. <laughs> Just look at your star. There's no hope in you for you. <laughs> what I want our listeners to do, if you want to borrow Dangerous Visions, this new reprint that your that your my producer has kindly got for the library, there's something else that I want you to borrow and read. The Library of America's The Future is Female. No. Yes. I want you to borrow and read that book. Which is an, a well, a lovingly curated anthology of great science fiction stories over a hundred years, yeah. written by women. Yeah, the women who had to put up with the wandering hands of people like Heinlein or Asimov or Ellison himself. The women yeah. had to put up with with boob jokes. Yeah, they're, the when they're getting on stage to accept an award for their writing, and they had to put up with it for decades. You're talking about Connie Willis, aren't you? <laughs> uh, you're talking about a whole bunch of people. Oh. <laughs> a whole bunch of people. A, 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 a big science fiction poobah getting up on stage in front of a, a whole audience full of writers and saying, well, we don't know anything about the identity of the author James Tiptree, but I think we can all agree these stories could not have been written by a woman. Next year, wow. story wins an award. A little gray-haired old woman stands up and says, I'm James Tiptree. Does the industry <laughs> learn from that? No. No, it doesn't. It just keeps uh, right on going like that. These women had to know these men. They had to work yeah. with them at conventions. They had to submit their work to them. Uh, if you're in the same city, an editor at a magazine, at Astounding or whatever, could almost be guaranteed to say, well, you included a headshot with your story, and I really think we should discuss it over a meal. Perhaps you should come over to my place. Oh, just... Oh. Dangerous Visions lives and uh, breathes in that world. So yeah. if you want to read it, because it is a legitimate historical science fiction anthology, read The Future is Female as well. Does the yeah. library have The Future is Female? It's, all LOA books are in our system. I don't have that one, but I came across the, that one recently in my travels, and I would like to get it. So we'll see if I can pull that off in 25. <laughs> or maybe somebody could come out with, uh, uh, maybe an editor, a woman, could come out with an anthology today. Mm. Mm. Uh, called safe visions maybe sure sure <laughs> that is that it, it, as long as that editor is an nk jemison as, as let's <laughs> let, maybe an editor could come out with an anthology today maybe that would be great yeah, absolutely well and the renaissance in the genre it's not science fiction but at least this uh romanticy genre is uh taking off like a shot and that seems very populated by women and that's great i mean so it, no it's that not is the i Irony here. That is the, the irony. That is the reason why all these old science fiction dinosaurs overcompensated at conventions because they knew perfectly well that they were being sold under the table by women <laughs> and that they always have been. Yeah. Henry yeah. Effing Fielding knew that. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> has known that. Trollope and Dickens knew that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's the insecurity at the heart of every male writer. <laughs> they know perfectly well that romance novels are going to outsell them by 10 to 1. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Who's eating today, I ask you? <laughs> mm. And <laughs> wow. But the well, problem yeah. they give themselves is that, oh, well, it's romance. You know, these ladies, they all write by a program. They're all morons. You know, whereas we're grappling with real art. Meet one of them. <laughs> That's what I say. Meet one of these ladies. They're the hardest workers in literature. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And they're yeah. not working off a program. Yeah. They're working for every reader they get. Yeah, very much so. And they seem to actually respect their readers. Enormously. That's respect. different. Respect and love their readers. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to subvert your expectations just to make you regret the $8 you spent on my book. I'm not going to do that. 
Right, right. <laughs> well, I think we can sum summarize today's episode with one visual, and that's this. <laughs> Oh no! Does this mean I have I randed myself into a mandatory all positive episode next week? I think we have no choice. It was so painful for me. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I have done that, haven't I? I mean, we would do that only if we were really, really into torpedoing what what ratings we have. So I mean, let's uh, let's just keep this, uh, you know, magical mystery we have tour. To do an all positive episode next time. <laughs> Isn't it funny that uh, a special episode on this show is an all positive episode? Yeah. We have a special this week. And <laughs> Steve likes something? <laughs> God bless book critics. <laughs> That's what I say. We love them. We love them all. We have nothing but adoration for our man. And we have adoration for someone else. This is actually, Steve, I'll have you know is National Friends of the Library Week. It is a national uh, holiday. I'm sure you heard all about it in the, in the press. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's big. Can we can we at least end on the same note to our viewers about how great the friends of any library are? All. They I do mean, essential work. If you've never thought of them, I guarantee your library runs by them. They do if essential you want, yeah. work. Absolutely. If you want to see a gaggle, a gaggle, a cluster of menches, that's what you do. You look at your friends in the Cedarburg Public Library. And Most I want you to do more. Realize, yeah. Libraries are so critically underfunded. They have their funding slashed every cycle. Every yep, if, they, yep. if you had to rely for your library functions only on what the library staff could do, you would have precious few library functions. That's not Absolutely. the staff being lazy. That's Absolutely. them having your community doesn't fund them. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. The friends take up that slack. They're the ones who do all the fun things and they have an operating budget. They need money of their own. The library can't pay them. No, no. So they, are great. they are absolutely great. We if had our, no matter how small your yeah. local library is, it has a friend's group. Absolutely. The functioning of the library. We had our um, author event last night uh, with Annalise Ryan. She was in uh, in our community room, um, and it was standing room only. Eighty people gathered together for a reading event, and I mean that's and that's the friends. That is all the friends. So they make that kind of thing happen with Cedarburg Reads every year, and, um, and a little they, uh, a little spice to the friends of the Cedarburg Public Library in specific is that not one but two of the friends of the Cedarburg Public Library were also on Pike Island. <laughs> Hey, you went off script this week, and I liked it. <laughs> they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> what we do want to talk about is that little scroll at the bottom of your screen, patreon.com forward slash books of the week. Uh, yeah. For a mere $3 a month, you can make our friends group, you know, and that, that, as I say on the radio and all these nonprofits, for the price of a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> so yes, and uh, we, we won't end by mentioning that the more money we guarantee that we make for the friends, the more likely it is that this show will stick around because after this episode, <laughs> that's not a selling point at all. <laughs> yeah, you know, but they close to the friends and they'll cancel the show. How's that? <laughs> This is what mentions they are. They tolerate us. <laughs> they would lynch me if I showed up and seen me. After all the things I've said about them, they would lynch me. <laughs> oh my! Here's Steve getting off the getting off the plane. <laughs> I mean, Wisconsin. week after week, I've said they're disaffected royalty <laughs> members. I've said they have hemophilia. I've said that one friends member is actually three friends members in a trench coat. <laughs> so I go. I keep saying things like that every week. They'd kill me if I showed up. <laughs> well, if that wasn't true, they would. <laughs> if there wasn't some truth to what Steve says. <laughs> anyway, folks, that is a wild show this week. Holy cow, Al Pacino and <laughs> at all <laughs> thank you for tuning in we're so happy that you uh pop over to our little uh corner of the uh of, of the dark web <laughs> you got, you got Yuval, Yuval Noah Harari Al Pacino uh <laughs> and Peter Ustinov in the same show what a rogues gallery <laughs> Yes, up with whoever or whatever George Santos is <laughs> <laughs> at the sound of the exploding brat it's time to hit the road everybody <laughs> have a wonderful week Steve thank you so much and uh, we will see you back here next week <laughs> Lord willing <laughs> bye y'all